You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com The Los Angeles coroner's office today confirmed that journalist Michael Hastings died Tuesday in a horrible car crash. His body was removed from the burned wreckage of his Mercedes, but it wasn't until today that he was identified. The 33-year-old Hastings was a reporter for Rolling Stone magazine when he wrote a profile about Army General Stanley McChrystal, which ultimately led to his resignation. The cause of the crash is under investigation, but it is believed that Hastings was driving at a high rate of speed. Toxicology tests on Hastings are expected back in about eight weeks. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on this 5th day of July 2013. Welcome to episode 274 of the Corbett Report podcast, Crashes of Convenience, Michael Hastings. What we've just been watching is footage of the evening broadcast of KTVU, the Fox News affiliate in Oakland, California, from the evening of June 20th, 2013, reporting on the car crash that took the life of Michael Hastings on the morning of June 18th, 2013. And just like that, one of the most dangerous mainstream reporters in America was dead. Before we look into the very mysterious circumstances surrounding that very mysterious car crash, however, perhaps we should reflect for a moment on that title, one of the most dangerous mainstream reporters in America. What does that really mean? Well, certainly, Michael Hastings came with a journalistic pedigree that most of the corporate prostitute mainstream journalists would, if you forgive the very unfortunate turn of phrase, die for. After having graduated with a degree in journalism from NYU back in 2002, Michael Hastings almost immediately took up a post with Newsweek, eventually becoming an embedded reporter in Iraq and spending much of the proceeding several years there, which he then parlayed into experiences for several books, including a bestseller, a New York Times bestseller, The Operators. But it is perhaps for a Rolling Stone article that he penned back in 2010 that he will be best known. In that article, The Runaway General, uh, Hastings reported on some of the very incendiary statements of General Stanley McChrystal, statements that eventually got McChrystal dismissed. The president, having accepted McChrystal's forced resignation because of the general's scornful remarks about the commander-in-chief and other administration officials in the now infamous Rolling Stone magazine interview, at a Rose Garden news event, the president saying General McChrystal's explosive comments and those of his top aides left the general unfit to lead. Today I accepted General Stanley McChrystal's resignation as commander of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. I did so with considerable regret, but also with certainty that it is the right thing for our mission in Afghanistan, for our military, and for our country. War is bigger than any one man or woman, whether a private or a president. And as difficult as it is to lose General McChrystal, I believe that it is the right decision for our national security. The conduct represented in the recently published article does not meet the standard that should be set by a commanding general. Now, any time a relatively mainstream reporter can actually get top brass Pentagon officials dismissed for their reporting, I think it definitely serves our interest to take a look into what they are actually reporting on. But it can still happen that sometimes these are the types of moves that happen behind the scenes with insiders and people who play in the, in the Beltway politics baseball game, that they can come across these types of stories and sometimes some of the pieces get shuffled around. Sometimes these stories aren't really that significant. But there is every indication that Michael Hastings was the real deal and he really was making some big time enemies in Washington before his all too untimely death at the age of 33. And for some more insight on that, rather than me simply expounding on Michael Hastings, his viewpoints, and his uh, journalistic career, why don't we leave that up for him to explain himself, as he did just over a year ago in an interview that was recorded by Senk Uyghur of the Young Turks. The Newsweek that I knew has been totally decimated and destroyed after it was sold for a dollar uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, when I was at Newsweek, when I started, there were 26 foreign correspondents. There's now, they now have two. 
Wow. See, yeah. that's a really interesting it, fact. I didn't yeah. know that. It's, it, it, so I sort of, I, coming up in the media, I've kind of witnessed this kind of you know, industry-wide change from, from a very kind of a ground, ground level. You said. What, what years were you in industry? 2002 to 2008. And then in, in 08, I covered the presidential election for Newsweek. Um, that was oh, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, covered Hillary, uh, Secretary Clinton, who was in Senator Clinton, and then dropped that and then quit Newsweek after she, uh, she left because I kind of got sick of Newsweek. Oh, that's interesting. You were covering uh, Senator Clinton at the time. At the time when she was running. When she was running. Oh, yeah, oh okay, yeah. yeah. And so what is that when you went over to Rolling Stone? Then I started uh, going to Afghanistan, and I'd go for Afghanistan and Iraq for GQ uh, for about a year and a half, and then uh, started writing for Rolling Stone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I, I basically, actually, you, you might as well I find this interesting. Newsweek, I found, was too mainstream, and I couldn't actually write what I really wanted to say. Uh-huh. Uh, and I kind of got sick of it, and I was like, I don't give a f- like I'm quitting this great job I have, or I'm getting all these benefits and going out on my own, and uh, and then and started doing my own thing, was kind of in the wilderness, and then and then uh, you know started writing to Rolling Stone. It's uh, okay. So it, once again, you've said something really interesting. So what's the how did that process work? So you would write something, and what your editor would say what? It's not even what the editor says. It's just the sort of legacy media companies have have particular voices. And what I, what I saw again and again was that the most interesting things that I was filing would end up on the cutting room floor, right? And, and sometimes it would be details, say, about a death squad. Sometimes it would be details about something else. But the stuff that I was most interested in never actually made it into the magazine. Um, and so I, I think, why is that? You know, and I think there, there, there's those sort of typical, uh, you know, you're writing for the sort of middle, middle American audience, so they don't want to take too many risks one or the other. I think that's part of it. Uh, but I also think that there's only there's a certain level of uh, truth that you can kind of convey through the sort of the, the, that kind of uh, magazine, and you have to go elsewhere if you really want to get close to the bone. At least for, for my opinion. So do you remember anything that stood out to you, like where you wrote something? You're like, oh, this is really good, but it's you know, I wonder if it'll push their buttons, and and then it turned out it didn't get picked up. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, I mean. There, well, here's a here's a, a more kind of clear cut example of that. Had I done the, so, I, I I did a big story about General Stanley and Crystal for Rolling Stone. Um, that story would not have made it into Newsweek. The way wow, it, okay, that so that's okay. Into Newsweek. Now we're having a conversation. They, they would have taken they would have taken all my good stuff and uh-huh. they would have buried it in the story. It would it would not have. So talk talk to me about that because so like if you guys don't know you know obviously M- Michael. Huge story about Michael, uh, about General McChrystal, and eventually uh, General McChrystal stepped down because of the revelations in Michael's story. And that's old school journalism. He was there, he documented it, etc. And I, and I remember when it came out, I pr- praise you to high heaven, not knowing you at all, because I was like, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to cover them and then reveal to people what your government is doing, etc., etc. So it had real impact. Now, a story like that, Newsweek in the old days, you would have think would have loved, right? Right, right. Depending on so, I, and I'll, I'll do a caveat. The, the Newsweek, as when John Meacham was editor, they would not have printed my story. I can guarantee you that because why do you think that is? Political reasons, for reasons that there's a sense that at Newsweek we were supposed to kind of uphold uh, that we're supposed to sort of reinforce our societal myths, not deconstruct them, and not kind of expose them. And so, so there was a real mission there. I think certainly under Meacham, Meacham sucks. Uh, oh, wow. you know, okay. who, he's on my enemies list, one of the people I wanted to go on a rant on at some point this week. Um, where, where they were not going to push the button. You know, like senior military officials, despite how they've lied to us and for a number of wars, uh, despite the Pentagon Papers, despite all we knew from, from that kind of Newsweek mainstream perspective, we're, we're going to be on this pedestal and we would not have criticized them that way. And I know this, I know this for a fact because you can actually go back and read Newsweek's profile of a crystal, which was done by a really great reporter, uh, a guy named, I don't want to get him in trouble, but they took this great reporter's stuff and then and they buried it, you know? And so, so one of the reasons I actually knew that, you know, there would be kind of an interesting story here is because when I read this original Newsweek story a year before my story came out and I was like, Wow, like there's like the reporter is trying to tell the truth here, and his editors are killing it. And if and if you have editors who are willing to kind of let that stuff free, uh, let it go, then maybe there could be something there. You know, that's Sorry. it. Really, really interesting because I I wrote an, an article I don't remember how many years ago now uh, on Huffington Post saying fire that that was the the headline was fire the editors because I said look I, I'm reading these amazing stories but I'm reading them on a twenty seven 
Like I, of course, I immediately knew that Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11 because if you read the whole paper, you knew that they would tell you, right? It's not like, but they buried it. That wasn't the headlines. That wasn't, and when you go on TV, it's even worse, right? So I felt like the problem wasn't the reporters. You know, the problem was the editors who were making these decisions on what to highlight, what to bury. Now, I wrote that God knows how many years ago, but it turns out, I mean, there you were in the trenches, and that's exactly the experience that you had. It, exactly. And, and you could see, and the pressure, I mean, certainly not for the Iraq war, I mean, you, you would sit around the editorial room, and you could see people whose entire careers you think would have been opposed to something like that, like flipping like light switches, stepping in line to kind of support these policies. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, no, ex ex exactly as you're saying. Uh, I mean, it's so difficult to kind of try to get the real news kind of into the paper, into the magazine. Um, I mean, the New York Times it has a couple of people who, who do it and do and do a great job. The Washington Post have a couple of people who do 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 a great job. It, but uh, but yeah, the editors make make it difficult. I think it's safe to say that those are not the words of someone who is guarding all of their statements very closely and is very concerned about how that will play inside the Beltway. This is definitely a mainstream reporter who strayed off the reservation and kicked back against the system that had fed him so well up till that point. And certainly I think we can see that Michael Hastings was the real deal, but if we can't see it from his own statements or from some of the uh, just reading about his journalistic career, why don't we take a look at some of the increasingly incendiary interviews that he was giving in even mainstream outlets on such things as the downfall of General David Petraeus and other matters that were really starting to rattle some chains inside the Beltway. I think there is a distinct lack of skepticism. I think when you have an institution like the Pentagon, every general since 2001 has said we are either winning or have won in Afghanistan, except for one moment when General McChrystal decided in 2009 to say, oh, actually, we're not winning. And he's, the only reason he said that was because he wanted more troops, right? But immediately after he said that, uh, then everyone else, then Petraeus and every other general that's followed him said, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, when it's clear that's not the case. So one has to say, why, why are we giving the Pentagon so much credibility to make these statements? Why hasn't the Pentagon press corps stood up and said, or some, a member of it, and say, you've said in 2002, 2003, 2004 that we've won this war. You've said in 2006, 2007, 2008 that we've won this war. Why are you now saying we have to fight there for 10 more years? And that is literally what General McChrystal just said. I think you lay it out, though, pretty well in your book. And here uh, we have a, a little passage that I'm going to write. And this is where you're talking about this media, military, industrial complex. And the same, you know, uh, idea that we think about Washington and Wall Street being too close. Everyone is too close to power and they're too scared. And so this was the reaction that you were getting from people after the original Rolling Stone piece came out, after you basically got a general fired. And uh, what happened, it says, it demonstrated just how tenuous one's position could be. Careers could flame out overnight. The political media class saw the story as a threat to their schmoozy, schmoozy excuse me, relationship, their very existence and social life. If you can't get wasted with a journalist who's writing a profile of you and piss all over the president who appointed you, what's the world coming to? Yeah, that didn't make me too many friends in the, uh, <laughs> in the Washington, D.C. Were you part. shocked by that response that you wrote? What was uh, an honest account? You didn't try to protect McChrystal or the aides that surrounded him. And then you got really crazy backlash. I, I was shocked that he, I, I was shocked that President Obama fired him. I think that was very significant. I did not realize how bad the relationship between uh, the president and the Pentagon had been. And I think what that meant was this was President Obama reasserting his control over the Pentagon. So yeah, I was shocked on that front. I was also surprised by the media's response. And it was a, it was a portion of the media, the Pentagon media, the national security media. And at first I was sort of confused about it. And I, and, and I was like, well, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They don't really mean what they're saying. Uh, about the story, but then as 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 the the, the months and mo as months and months went on, uh, and I would and I would I'd get along fine with different government officials uh, for the most part, but there was still this really intense you know hatred among among a few of my colleagues, and I think and, and what and the sort of insight I had or, or what I kind of realized was that the Pentagon press corps is just that they're the press corps for the Pentagon, and I know that sounds overstated. Well, they serve the Pentagon and they're scared to uh, hurt the feelings, hurt I guess feelings. you could say, or step on the toes of the Pentagon. Right. Look, you know, there was a Pentagon spokesperson, a guy by the name of Jeff Morrell, and now now you, you knew Jeff Morrell was telling the truth because he'd start to sweat because he'd be lying every uh, all the other time, and and I, I was on I, I listened to a radio show and it's like Jeff Morrell and reporter from X mainstream publication and I'm not going to mention and they and, and they sound the same you know and and they're complimenting each other and saying what great jobs they're both doing
Well, Michael Hastings, uh, in your BuzzFeed article, The Sins of General David Petraeus, mm -hmm. you argue that Petraeus was a master of deception. Uh, do you think he should have resigned? Uh, I mean, I think there's many other reasons Petraeus should have resigned besides uh, who he's sleeping with that's not his, his wife. But, but I, I just want to make a point here. That the larger point that I've been making is that essentially the media has played a role in uh, protecting David Petraeus and promoting David Petraeus and mythologizing David Petraeus. And, and we saw it here tonight. Uh, G General Kimmett, who was a spokesperson in Baghdad, who was a roommate of uh, Petraeus, who, who, who was involved in one of the biggest debacles uh, in, in recent foreign policy history, is on TV you know, defending uh, David Petraeus without actually addressing the real problems with David Petraeus' record. And those are the fact that he manipulated the White House into escalating to Afghanistan. He ran a campaign in Iraq that was brutally savage, uh, included arming uh, the, the worst of the worst, Shiite death squads, Sunni militiamen. Uh, and, and then you go back to the training of the Iraqi army program that uh, also had similar problems. So for me, uh, all the while he's going around the country uh, talking about honor and integrity. So for me, the questions of honor and integrity, I was raising those uh, earlier. A number of other journalists who were actually covering David Petraeus were raising those concerns. You might not get that from, from someone like Barbara Starr at CNN, who is essentially uh, a, a spokesperson in a, a, for, the, for the Pentagon in many ways. So I, I think uh, I just want to step back and, and, and to have my piece, uh, because I, this, even the way the scandal is being covered is so different than how usually usual sex scandals are being covered, where they hammer the guy mercilessly. Now everyone's saying, oh my God, he was at, you know, he just went to the CIA. How could he be, you know, he, he was susceptible to being seduced by this woman. You know, give me a break. Petraeus now has all his allies coming out okay. to defend him, where Paula Broadwell is, is there uh, yet again. Uh, you know, where are her protectors? Okay, well, but Barbara's not a spokesperson for him, obviously. Um, but let's let's move to the Senate Colonel. For I, not, not not too obviously. I I followed her coverage pretty closely, as she's covered my work before too. Well, just because she's written uh, naughty things about you, it doesn't make her a spokesperson. No, what makes her a spokesperson is repeating without question a lot of Pentagon claims. I never heard, I never saw George W. Bush give a speech where he, he conceded that, you know, these he, decisions he had, aren't he had, he had that simple. Speech writers. He had better speechwriters at this time. I don't know what happened to the first <laughs> speechwriters, but certainly they weren't working on this speech. I mean, this speech, in, in my view, if you compare this speech to his, uh, the, the speech he gave in Cairo in 2009, or his Nobel Prize speech, you see an, a, a kind of almost total rejection of the civil rights tradition that the President Obama supposedly came out of, a total rejection of any kind of uh, the, the, these ideas of, of a kind of peaceful transition, of a kind of trying to work with uh, the fellow people in, in different nations, and in just an embrace of total militarism. And the reason I say this is because that speech to me was essentially agreeing with uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney that we're at, in this sort of neoconservative paradigm, that we're at war with a jihadist threat that actually is not a nuisance, but the most important threat we are facing today. It is a complete, in my view, a complete rejection of what John Kerry said, and I said, an embrace of militarism. He's, I, but, I he's, he's, but he's talking about... He's saying, he's saying, he says that many multiple things. He, he, right, he, no, I, I he agree, I agree it's right. complex, but I mean... The, but the, no, the it's not only that. complex, but he enshrines... Look, the, the two key things that I took away from that speech is that Obama has enshrined the two most radical principles of the Bush doctrine. The first is, oh, he, he got rid of, sort of got rid of torture and sort of got rid of extraordinary rendition, but enshrines targeted assassination. At the same time, he, he, he doesn't apply apologize for, uh, he, he won't apologize for the scandal in Benghazi, he won't apologize for the IR, really the IRS, a few bad apples, and he says, no, the AP and spying on journalists is okay, so he enshrines uh, killing people and spying on journalists as the two major tenets of his national security state. I think this is outrageous. I'm not, I don't agree with what Michael said, I'm just going to be blunt about it. The well, president. I read your piece. I read your piece. It was it was essentially you know talking points from the White House. It was stenography, and and you know I mean look I I, I did your work and, and I, I've you know read it in the past as, as a colleague, but I was not impressed with with the piece that we were sent around by the producer. Well, wait, wait, let's let Perry explain what yeah. you said before you say we're not impressed with it. Let's yeah. hear. Well, it. I can say it. I read it. One only has to look at the face of Kyron Skinner sitting next to Michael Hastings in that final clip there to realize just how how far off the deep end Mike, uh, Michael Hastings was going in some of his commentary. He was definitely not playing nice. He was not playing softball with these people. He was saying it as it was. And that last interview coming merely weeks before his fiery death. So it is definitely interesting to see the way Michael Hastings developed and the way his personal opinions developed as he became more and more confident in his journalism and more and more prepared to strike out against the establishment. And it was, again, quite a tragedy to see his, his ultimate untimely demise, once again, at the 
ripe, tender young age of 33. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at the car crash that ultimately claimed his life. Rolling Stone magazine called Michael Hastings a fearless journalist who refused to cozy up to power. His death at 33 came by way of a fire-fueled and explosive crash where Hancock Park meets Hollywood there at Highland and Melrose. It sounded like a bomb went off in the middle of the night. My house shook, the windows were rattling. Hastings was a 2010 Polk Award winner for magazine reporting. He was alone in what investigators say was a brand new Mercedes. I couldn't have written a scene like this for a movie where the engine flies from the car, which was about, I don't know, 50, 60 yards up right down here to this telephone pole. That from a longtime Hollywood producer Gary Grossman, while about 4.30 in the morning, his neighbor and a garden hose and all they were up against. Some of the pieces of this puzzle are just so bizarre that they almost cannot be explained in any other way than that there was some type of foul play involved. A brand new Mercedes C250 does not simply explode into flames at the drop of a hat very easily, and in fact, I think we would be hard-pressed to find another case of this type of a crash happening at all with such a vehicle, let alone one that resulted in the engine being thrown a hundred yards out, and with an explosion that sounded like a boom that rattled this uh, neighbor's house. This is a bizarre incident that truly does indicate that there was something very strange going on, and this was only further corroborated by one of the witnesses at the scene who was interviewed by the Young Turks, and I won't play the audio of that because it is in Spanish, so for the people listening to the audio of this podcast, it would um, perhaps be lost on the English-speaking audience, but he does confirm that the, f the car was actually in flames before it crashed into the tree. And in fact, the witness also confirms that although the uh, the car was going almost full speed by the time he had crossed the intersection uh, into the final stretch before hitting that tree, it suddenly accelerated and went completely out of control and then hit the tree. All again, very, very strange, very suspicious, especially considering the fact that uh, Michael Hastings was not a drunk. In fact, he had not dr drank in 10 years prior to this incident. And uh, there was every indication that he was, uh, in every other way, a very careful driver and had been for some time, with this coming from close personal friends of Michael, which, of course, raises the question that if this was some sort of foul play, if there was some type of sabotage or incendiary device or something that had been planted in his car or had taken over his car in order to cause the crash, what would be the motive of such a, of such a thing? Why would we even speculate about this? Well, unfortunately, in the hours and days preceding the crash, it emerged that there were, in fact, several reasons to suspect that there had been foul play. Well, uh, now we're finding out some new things about uh, what happened with Michael. Now, we yesterday told you about, uh, of course, how he passed away at 4.30 in the morning in L.A. in a single car uh, crash. Uh, it was a very fiery crash, and the engine was thrown about, some say, 50 uh, feet, some say uh, far uh, bigger distance than that. Uh, interesting uh, tweet that just came out uh, a little before the show from WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks says Michael Hastings contacted WikiLeaks lawyer Jennifer Robinson just a few hours before he died, saying that the FBI was investigating him. Now, that's interesting, of course, on a couple of different fronts. Number one, I have no idea if that's true or not true uh, in terms of whether WikiLeaks is accurate about that or if Michael was accurate about that. Uh, I do know that uh, Michael was concerned about government surveillance. He said it on this show all the time. He also said it off air. And he had rights to be concerned. Of course, the government, it turns out, was surveilling reporters such as the Associated Press and, uh, of course, uh, James Rosen at uh, Fox News Channel and perhaps some CBS reporters as well. And then I went back and found the last article that uh, Michael had written uh, for BuzzFeed. And it says, Why Democrats Love to spy on Americans. Makes a very good point about President Obama, as he has done on this show many times, talking about how President Obama had a, what he called a war on journalism. And uh, I realized towards the end of the article that he had talked about how the 
uh, Obama administration and its al allies, the FBI and Department of Justice, had viciously attacked reporters and anyone else that they viewed to be a threat. Uh, and you can interpret it for yourself, you can read it for yourself, and you should. It's a fascinating article. Last week, Hastings was killed in a high-speed one-car crash. Immediately, his friends started raising questions about whether this was really an accident, as police quickly ruled. Then yesterday, we learned that hours before his death, Hastings sent a cryptic email to his friends and associates saying that the feds were investigating him and that he was on to a big story. Sergeant Joe Biggs is one of the friends who received that chilling email, and he joins us live. Sergeant, thank you for being here, and thank you for your service. So you knew Michael Hastings, uh, and I know that this raised alarm bells for you when you heard that he was killed. Why do you question whether this was truly an accident? Um, it's the fact, the way that I, the other times that we've spoken before, and this email I got, it was just very panicked and it didn't seem like something normally we would talk about. And I just felt a gut feeling, something didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. But the police say I, it's an uh, accident. Uh, they they you know, looked into it. They said, look, he was driving fast. It was 4.30 in the morning. It was dark. Lost control of the car, went through a red light, hit a tree. Well, his friends and family, they know him. Everyone says he drives like a grandma. So that right there doesn't seem like something that he would be doing. I mean, he had a lot of friends and family that cared about him. He had a, a good life to live. There's no way he would be acting erratic like that and driving that out of control. What do, what do you think is going on here? I mean, because we've, we've talked about this a couple of times just because it's getting so much attention on the Internet and, and people who are close to Mr. Hastings uh, are still raising questions, questions about the LAPD and their conclusions that this was an accident. What is the alternate theory, that he was, that he was murdered, that he was intentionally targeted by someone? Um, I don't know that. Uh, I just know that from the email to hours later dying, it's just not a coincidence like that. Things don't add up. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Um, I contacted by email Mercedes a day, asked them if it's normal for their cars to blow up to that extent, um, for if the engines fly out on a normal basis. I mean, these are the real questions we need to ask. And what of the, I mean, obviously he was investigating a couple of high-profile cases. He was looking into, he said, um, Jill Kelly, uh, who was connected with the whole uh, David well, that, Petraeus that's and, been, and General, General Clark. Go ahead. His wife today said that that's definitely not true, that he was uh, investigating into Jill Kelly. Michael Hastings' wife says he was not investigating that. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, what was he investigating, as far as you know, that would have caused any consternation whatsoever by someone? CIA, but from what he said, or his last, one of the things he said is it was going to be the biggest story yet. Sadly, these reports do confirm the worst fears of those whose suspicions were raised in those first hours after Michael Hastings' crash that foul play was involved. We now have, apparently, from Michael Hastings himself, word that he was at least uh, under the impression that he was being investigated by the FBI, he was on the verge of breaking a very large story. And just like so many of the other figures that we've covered in this series in the past, including people like Danny Casolaro and Gary Webb and others who were working on material when they ended up dying and meeting their own untimely demises, Michael Hastings, too, met a very unfortunate death at a seemingly very key moment. And once again, this is a developing story, so I'm sure there will be more to come in the weeks ahead, but it is very important that we establish the fact that it very well could have been foul play that took Michael Hastings' life. And to establish that, I think it would definitely serve our interest to take a look at the idea of car sabotage and how that can be accomplished electronically in this very electronic era. And to do that, let's turn to an article that appeared in the New York Times back in March of 2011 under the headline, Researchers Show How a Car's Electronics Can Be Taken Over Remotely. Quote, With a modest amount of expertise, computer hackers could gain remote access to someone's car, just as they do to people's personal computers, and take over the vehicle's basic functions, including control of its engine, 
according to a report by computer scientists from the University of California, San Diego, and the University of Washington. Although no such takeovers have been reported in the real world, the scientists were able to do exactly this in an experiment conducted on a car they bought for the purpose of trying to hack it. Their report, delivered last Friday to the National Academy of Sciences Transportation Research Board, described how such unauthorized intrusions could theoretically take place. Because many of today's cars contain cellular connections and Bluetooth wireless technology, it is possible for a hacker working from a remote location to take control of various features, like the car locks and brakes, as well as to track the vehicle location, eavesdrop on its cabin, and steal vehicle data, the researcher said. They described a range of potential compromises of car security and safety. End quote. I would encourage you to continue reading that article, which of course will be linked up in the show notes. But for those of you who are incredulous at those well-known conspiracy theorists of the University of California, San Diego and the University of Washington and their conspiracy research, well, don't take their word for it. Take DARPA's. Good afternoon. All right, so we've been hearing a lot today about the importance of improving computer security. As Dan just alluded to, though, it's not just traditional computers that we need to worry about. There are many other kinds of systems as well. The slide that's been omitted uh, showed a result of uh, the researchers at UCSD and the University of Washington hacking into the dashboard display of a typical American sedan, making it show that the car was going 140 miles an hour while in park. Drilling down a little bit, modern vehicles consist of between 30 and 100 embedded control units, which are essentially small computers connected via a CAN bus. These cars are required by law to have a diagnostic port, typically located under the steering wheel, that allows mechanics to download diagnostic information and to perform software updates. In a first paper, the researchers from UCSD and the University of Washington showed that if they could touch the CAN bus through that diagnostic port, they could take over all of the functionality of the car that's controlled by software. And in a modern automobile, that's pretty much everything. The brakes are controlled by software because of anti-lock braking. The acceleration is controlled by software because of cruise control. And in those fancy new cars that can park themselves, even the steering is under software control. The reaction to this first paper was somewhat muted, perhaps because of the researchers had access to that diagnostic port, they were inside the car and so already had physical access to the brakes, acceleration and steering. They responded with a second paper in which they showed a variety of ways of touching that CAN bus without physically touching the car. These attacks involved infecting uh, the computers in the repair shop and then having that inspection, infection spread to the car through the diagnostic port or hacking in through the Bluetooth system or using the cell phone network to break in through the telematics unit that's normally used to provide roadside assistance. The most ingenious attack, though, used the stereo system in the car. The researchers were able to craft an electronic version of a song that played just fine in your home stereo system or on your personal computer. But when you put that on a CD and played it in the car CD player, it took over total control of your automobile. Yeah, right. Pretty scary, huh? And if DARPA's word for it isn't convincing enough, we can also get Richard Clark's word for this. Richard Clark, of course, being the former counterterrorism czar under Clinton and Bush, who was contacted by the Huffington Post about the Hastings assassination for reasons I can't even imagine, and actually gave a very interesting comment. And that's reported on in an article that appeared on the 26th of June on the, uh, uh, sorry, appeared on the 24th of June, was updated on the 26th on the Huffington Post under the headline, Was Michael Hastings' car hacked? Richard Clark says it's possible. Quote, The peculiar circumstances of journalist Michael Hastings' death in Los Angeles last week have unleashed a wave of conspiracy theories. Now there's another theory to contribute to the paranoia. According to a prominent security analyst, technology exists that could have allowed someone to hack his car. Former U.S. National Coordinator for Security, Infrastructure Protection, and Counterterrorism Richard Clark told the Huffington Post that what is known about the single vehicle crash is consistent with a car cyber attack. Clark said, There is reason to believe that intelligence agencies for major powers, including the United States, know how to remotely seize control of a car. What has been revealed as a result of some research at universities is that it's relatively easy to hack your way into the control system of a car and to do such things as cause acceleration when the driver doesn't want acceleration, to throw on the brakes when the driver doesn't want the brakes, to launch an airbag, Clark told the Huffington Post, you can do some really highly destructive things now through hacking a car, and it's not that hard. 
So if there were a cyber attack on the car, and I'm not saying there was, Clark added, I think whoever did it would probably get away with it. I'm not a conspiracy guy. In fact, I've spent most of my life knocking down conspiracy theories, said Clark, who ran afoul of the second Bush administration when he criticized the decision to invade Iraq after 9-11. But my rule has always been, you don't knock down a conspiracy theory until you can prove it wrong. And in the case of Michael Hastings, what evidence is available publicly is consistent with the car cyber attack. And the problem with that is, you can't prove it. End quote. This is a bizarre story, a bizarre admission, a bizarre uh, a twist in all of this that, again, I can't really account for. I can't, can't account for why the reporter on, for the Huffington Post, Mike Hogan, thought to contact Richard Clark about this or why Richard Clark would be going public about this. But here we are. We have the uh, former counterterrorism czar, someone who wrote the book Cyber War in 2010, wa a warning about the possibility of cyber attacks, cyber terrorism, cyber hacking, and the like, and who is now going out uh, and admitting that the intelligence agencies of major powers, including the United States, have the ability to hack into people's cars and make it look like a car accident so that you would never know the difference. This is especially chilling because the, the very key point there is that there's no way of telling when a cyber attack has been committed in something like this. Uh, assuming that the evidence has been destroyed either digitally or in the actual fire itself, there would be no fingerprints by which one could trace this back to whatever intelligence agency or rogue outlet had hijacked the car uh, manually. And thus, there would be no way of proving or disproving a theory like this, unless, of course, one were able to actually catch the, uh, the people who committed the act or to uh, get a confession from one of them, which, all things considered, would be highly unlikely. But again, that Richard Clark would come out and freely admit this is extremely head-scratchingly bizarre. And perhaps it's uh, to promote sales of his own book and to promote the ever- present cyber terror hype that he's constantly uh, warning about. But in the case of Michael Hastings' crash, what, what intelligence agency, what power could possibly benefit from the death of Michael Hastings other than the United States? Hastings, of course, riling up the top brass of the Pentagon, responsible for the, the dismissal of General Stanley McChrystal, working on a story that had to do with the CIA and the NSA scandal, going into corners and and talking about things that no one else in the controlled corporate media would even dare to bring up. Who else would possibly have the motivation in this case to do something like hack into his car? Now, I think it's important to note that I, I think that if his car was hacked into, and indeed that was what accounted for this unbelievable acceleration, in fact, the eyewitness interviewed by the Young Turk saying that he believed the car was probably going top speed by the time it hit the tree... If there was a hacking that to, that to account for that, I think there still has to be something else, an explosive or incendiary device to account for the fact that the car was on fire before it hit the tree, and the fact that there was a loud explosion that actually rattled people's houses uh, at the time that the car collided and impacted the tree. I think that has to be seen in the context of something something more than this, perhaps a car bomb of some some device. And again, until we start getting some of the forensic details, assuming we ever do get some of the forensic details, it will be difficult to ascertain exactly what happened. But there will be a toxicology test that will be released in a few weeks that may or may not put to rest some of the um, people in the, well, the usual places that want to decry this as just another uh, car crash from just another drunk driver. As Breitbart.com has forwarded in their coverage of this, uh, on the 21st of June 2013, they released uh, an article under the headline, LA Weekly, Michael Hastings' car was speeding, had drunk driving history, which uh, goes into some very spurious details of Michael Hastings' past and attempts to use that to smear him and basically uh, make this seem like it was just just another drunk driving accident. Uh, or you could turn to something like HollywoodReporter.com that had the, their own article on that subject on the 20th of June. Car experts on Michael Hastings' crash 
no reason to suspect flat foul play. Well, con contrast these car experts uh, by reported on by the hard-hitting Hollywood reporter to someone like former counterterrorism czar Richard Clark, who admits that this is perfectly consistent with a cyber car hacking incident and weigh the uh, the possibilities there as you will. But I think that these, at least some of this, can be put to rest by the toxicology tests, which will be available in a few weeks. And assuming that uh, Michael Hastings' most close personal confidants are correct, then Michael Hastings uh, was not a drunk, certainly not a drunk driver, did not drive recklessly, and was uh, driving one of the safest cars on the road, the Mercedes, that uh, that is known for its safety. So the idea that it just suddenly uh, spontaneously exploded uh, upon impact of a tree uh, after a high-speed impact is suspicious at best, and the, uh, the way that the engine shot out of the car is almost completely unaccountable for by anything other than some type of explosive device. So what we have here is definitely reasons to suspect foul play, but again, this is a developing story, and until we can find out more about what Michael Hastings was working on, we only do have suspicions to go on at this point. So I'm going to leave this episode here today for those of you at home to continue following this cookie crumb trail as the cookie crumbs continue to surface. But I am very interested in what your own research turns up on this. So please get in touch with me at CorbettReport.com, either on Twitter at Corbett Report or through my website, CorbettReport.com slash contact for more details as they continue to emerge. Uh, but I think that the it is extremely clear that what we have here is a mainstream journalist who was very much fighting against that establishment, even in some relatively mainstream venues, who had quite a bit of success in his journalism and even was able to shake up some of the top brass of the Pentagon, admittedly working on a large developing story that would have sh shaken some of the top intelligence agencies in the U.S. intelligence hierarchy, and uh, believed that he was being investigated by the FBI just hours before he met his fiery death, I think there is more than enough reason to suspect that something very untoward took place here, and it is definitely our responsibility as the free and independent media to be investigating that. So once again, I will leave you here today on that very discordant note as we continue to follow this story at the Corbett Report in the future. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thank you for joining me for another edition of the Corbett Report. Looking forward to talking to you again next week. Information out loud. You pack in your ticket, then you give it your own information out loud. Because you can't find a man. I'll buy yourself to send my name. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.